I never asked to be born and my parents never really wanted me either. My mom says she was young and foolish, madly in love with a guy who couldn't stay loyal. Before long, she found out she was pregnant. That baby was me, Rachel, the mistake. Mom wanted to get rid of me, but both sets of grandparents found out and stopped her. Back then, people didn't raise kids alone, so my parents got married, and I came along 11 months later, kicking and screaming. Dad never let me forget how I ruined his life. There goes my youth, he'd say every time he looked at me. To him, I wasn't a daughter. I was a burden, something holding him back from the life he thought he deserved. For 12 years, it was just the four of us in that tiny house. I tiptoed around trying not to make Dad mad, while mom cooked and cleaned like her life depended on it. Dad would come home from work with a frown that only got worse when he saw me. Then my little sister Olivia was born the miracle child, the one they actually wanted. After that, I was pushed even more into the background. Rachel, watch your sister. Rachel, be quiet, Olivia sleeping. Rachel, why can't you be more like Olivia? It was always about Olivia. She got new clothes while I wore hand-me-downs. She got praised, and I got scolded. She got love, and I learned to live with disappointment. By the time I was 10, I was doing most of the housework cleaning toilets, mopping floors, dusting shelves. You name it, I did it. Not that anyone thanked me. It was just expected. But there was one thing I didn't mind doing. Cooking. Something about mixing ingredients and creating flavors felt like magic. I remember the first time I made my special lasagna for a family gathering. Aunt Kelly took a bite, and her eyes lit up. Cheryl, this is incredible. When did you become such a great cook? Mom just smiled and took the compliment, soaking up the praise. I stood in the corner, invisible as always. Actually, I made it, I said, trying to speak up. They laughed like I had told a joke. Rachel likes to help in the kitchen sometimes, Mom quickly added, still soaking in the compliments. Isn't that right, dear? I closed my mouth, knowing it didn't matter. No one ever believed me anyway. As I grew up, the kitchen became my escape. While Olivia got all the attention and gifts, I found comfort in cooking. By the time I reached high school, I could make a great pot roast, one even Dad couldn't complain about. Not bad, he grunt, stuffing his face. Coming from him, that was high praise. But cooking wasn't just about feeding my family, I had bigger dreams. Every night, I'd imagine my own restaurant, full of happy customers enjoying my dishes. One night at dinner, I couldn't hold it in any longer. I want to open a restaurant someday, I blurted out. The silence that followed was overwhelming. Then Olivia snickered. You? A restaurant? Mom looked worried, like I had just said I wanted to be an astronaut. Dad didn't even bother looking up from his plate. Restaurants fail all the time. You'd be broke in a month, he said. But I'm good at cooking. Everyone likes my food. I protested. Everyone likes free food, Dad scoffed. That doesn't mean they'd pay for it. Olivia chimed in with her sickly sweet voice. Maybe you could work at McDonald's, Rachel. I hear they're always hiring. When it was time for college, I had my heart set on the best culinary school I could find. To my surprise, Dad agreed to pay for it. This is your inheritance, he said gruffly. Don't expect anything else. The house, the savings that's all going to Olivia. I should have felt hurt, but I was too excited about culinary school to care. This was my chance to prove myself, to learn from real chefs and get better at what I loved. College was a whirlwind of chopping, sautéing, and baking. For the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged. My classmates appreciated my cooking, and my instructors praised my creativity. But reality hit hard after graduation. With no money for my own place, I had to move back home. The difference between my exciting college life and my family's coldness was huge. So, you're a chef now? Olivia smirked over dinner. Does that mean you'll be doing all the cooking from now on? Before I could answer, Mom jumped in. That's a great idea. Rachel can cook, and you can focus on your studies, dear. Just like that, I was back to being the family maid, but this time with a culinary degree collecting dust on my shelf. I managed to get a job as an assistant chef at a local restaurant. The pay wasn't great, but it was a start. Every night, I came home completely exhausted, 
only to face piles of dishes and laundry. This is your rent, mom would say, handing me a list of chores. You're not a kid anymore. You need to help out. But I didn't let it get to me. Every free moment I was planning, dreaming, and hoping. I knew that one day, I have my own restaurant. And when that day came, I'd show them all what I could really do. Three long years passed, each day feeling the same. I cooked, I cleaned, I worked hard at the restaurant, and I watched as Olivia got everything I had always wanted. The day Olivia started high school, Dad came home with a huge grin on his face. Olivia, honey, come see what I got you, he called out. We all went outside, and sitting in the driveway, like a shiny slap in the face, was a brand new car. A car? But I don't even know how to drive yet, Olivia said, eyes wide with surprise. Dad laughed and tossed her the keys. You will soon enough. My girl deserves the best from the start. I bit my tongue so hard I could taste blood. When I turned 17, I got a second-hand bike, and that was only because I needed it to get to my part-time job. And it didn't stop there. Every week, there was something new for Olivia. The latest iPhone, a MacBook Pro, designer clothes. They even renovated her bedroom, turning it into something that looked like a luxury hotel room. Meanwhile, I was still in my old room, with the same faded wallpaper and the same squeaky bed I'd had since I was 12. At least the spiders kept me company, right? I started thinking about moving out. Maybe I could find a roommate and share the rent on a tiny apartment. Anything would be better than this constant reminder of how little I mattered. But then Christmas came around. I had been saving up, determined to get everyone nice gifts for once, to show them I wasn't the failure they thought I was. I ended up buying lottery tickets for everyone not the cheap scratch-offs, but tickets for the big jackpot. Christmas morning came, and I handed out the envelopes, trying not to look too eager. Mom opened hers first, and her face dropped. Oh, lottery tickets, she said. Dad snorted. What is this, a gas station gift? Olivia didn't even bother opening hers. She just rolled her eyes. Gee, thanks, Rachel. Really thoughtful. Mom tried to sound nice, but her voice was dripping with fake sweetness. I guess since Rachel didn't really get us anything, she won't be expecting any gifts either. That seems fair, doesn't it? Mom said, her voice cold. I felt a lump in my throat. Without saying a word, I snatched the lottery tickets from Dad's hand. You know what? I'll take them. Merry bloody Christmas. I stormed out, ignoring their shocked faces. Who cared about their family dinner anyway? I texted my coworker Lauren. Hey, you still at the restaurant? Mind some company. An hour later, I was sitting at the bar of the closed restaurant, sipping cheap champagne with Lauren. As the night went on, we swapped stories about horrible families and crushed dreams. It wasn't exactly a warm, cozy Christmas, but at least I didn't feel so alone. A few days later, I was at work, same as usual. During my break, I checked my phone and saw a missed call from an unknown number. Probably just another scam, I muttered, tossing the phone aside. But then it rang again, same number. Curiosity got the better of me, and I answered. Hello, is this Rachel Jackson? A cheery voice asked. Yeah, who's this? This is Kelly from the State Lottery Commission. I'm calling to inform you that you're holding a winning ticket. I almost dropped the phone. What? Are you serious? Absolutely. One of your tickets matched all the numbers in the Christmas drawing. After taxes, your winnings come to $900,000. The world spun around me. In a daze, I headed home, my mind racing. This was at my chance to finally open my own restaurant, to prove to everyone what I could do. I burst through the front door, unable to contain my excitement. You won't believe what happened. I blurted out. They were all sitting at the kitchen table, staring at me like I had grown a second head. I won the lottery. One of the tickets, the one I was going to give mom, it won $900,000 after taxes. For a moment, there was stunned silence. Then Olivia's shrill voice broke the quiet. That money belongs to us, she screeched. You bought those tickets as gifts for mom and dad. Anything that belongs to them belongs to me. It felt like a slap in the face. No, they gave the tickets back to me. They're mine, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. 
Mom and Dad exchanged a glance. Then Dad spoke slowly. Rachel, be reasonable. You live under our roof. You owe us. Now hand over that ticket. We'll take care of everything. I stepped back, my hand instinctively going to my pocket where the lottery ticket was. No, I said, surprising myself with how steady my voice was. This is my ticket, my win. I'm going to use it to open my own restaurant. Dad's face turned bright red. Now you listen here, young lady. No, you listen, I shouted, all the frustration from years of being treated like I didn't matter spilling out. I've spent my whole life being treated like I'm less than everyone else in this family. Well, not anymore. This is my chance, and I'm taking it. If that's how you feel, Mom said coldly, then you can get out of this house. Now. I looked at them, these people who were supposed to love me no matter what, and in that moment, I saw them clearly for the first time. Fine, I whispered. I'm gone. I stormed upstairs, packed a few clothes and essentials into a bag and walked out. They watched me leave, probably thinking I'd be back in a couple of days, begging to return. But they couldn't have been more wrong. My first stop was the lottery office to claim my winnings. Then I headed straight to a real estate agent. I need an apartment, I told the surprised agent. Something available immediately. By that evening, I was sitting in my very own place. It wasn't much, just a small one-bedroom in a decent neighborhood, but it was mine, all mine. As I sat on the floor, I hadn't had time to buy furniture yet. Eating takeout and scrolling through restaurant equipment catalogs on my phone, I felt something I hadn't felt in years. Hope. First things first, I needed a solid business plan. I spent weeks glued to my laptop, researching, crunching numbers, and planning every single detail. After what seemed like endless revisions, I finally had a plan I was proud of. Next step, finding the perfect location. I searched the city for the right spot, and eventually, I found it a small, rundown place that had been vacant for years. The landlord almost laughed when I told him I wanted to turn it into a restaurant. Good luck with that, sweetheart, he said with a chuckle, handing me the keys. The next four months were a blur of hard work. I hired contractors, chose every fixture, and personally scrubbed every inch of the place. It was tough, back-breaking work, but each blister and bruise felt like a badge of honor. Finally, opening day arrived. I stood in the kitchen, my kitchen surrounded by the staff I had personally hired and trained. When the first order came in, a rush of excitement surged through me. Let's do this, I said, tying on my apron. The first few months were a blur. I worked 20-hour days, cooking, managing, and doing whatever needed to be done. Slowly but surely, word started to spread. People loved my food not just for the taste but for the care and creativity I put into every dish. I introduced a loyalty program for regular customers, offering them special discounts and first dibs on new menu items. It was a hit, and soon I had a core group of regulars who came in so often they felt like family. But I didn't stop there. I started a delivery service, partnering with local couriers to bring my food straight to people's homes. It was a risk at first keeping the quality high was tricky, but it paid off. Social media also became my best tool. I posted daily specials, behind-the-scenes videos from the kitchen, and talked with customers online. My follower count grew, and so did my customer base. Three years in, I was finally turning a profit. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was something. I even started looking for a second location. Opening the second restaurant was easier in some ways I knew what I was doing this time, but harder in others. I couldn't be in three places at once, so I had to learn how to trust my staff and delegate responsibilities. We made it work, though, and four years after that, I opened my third location. Before I knew it, I was the proud owner of a successful restaurant chain me, Rachel Jackson, the girl who was never supposed to amount to anything. I won't lie, it wasn't easy. There were nights I cried myself to sleep, wondering if I'd taken on too much. Days when I wanted to quit and give up. But every time I walked into one of my restaurants, saw happy customers, and smelled the amazing food, I knew it was all worth it. One Saturday, I was in my office, going over the finances for my newest restaurant, when my phone rang. I glanced at the screen and froze. It was a number I hadn't seen in years home. 
For a moment, I thought about letting it go to voicemail, but curiosity got the best of me. I answered cautiously, Hello? Rachel, it's mom. Her voice was hesitant. Look, I know we haven't been on the best terms, but we need your help. It's about Olivia. Of course, it was about Olivia. It always was. What about her? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Dad's voice came on the line. She's in trouble, Rachel. She lost her job. They're accusing her of theft, and now no one will hire her. We were hoping you might have a position for her at one of your restaurants. I almost laughed. After everything they put me through, now they had the nerve to ask for a favor. But then I thought about Olivia. Despite everything, she was still my sister. Let me talk to her, I said. I said, and Olivia came on the line. Her voice was small and scared. Rachel, I'm sorry for everything. I really need help. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Okay, I said finally. I'll give you a job, but listen, there's no special treatment. If you mess up, you're out. Got it. Yes, thank you, thank you, Olivia said, her voice full of relief. The next morning, Olivia showed up right on time. She looked nervous, but determined. I started her off with some basic administrative tasks, slowly increasing her responsibilities over time. To my surprise, she took the job seriously. She paid attention during training, asked good questions, and never complained about the work. One night, as we were closing up, Olivia broke down. I need to tell you the truth, she sobbed. I didn't steal anything from my last job. My boss, he tried to force himself on me. When I said no, he fired me and spread rumors that I was a thief. I felt a surge of anger. Why didn't you report him? Who would believe me over him? Olivia wiped her eyes. I was so scared, Rachel. I didn't know what to do. I believe you, I said, pulling her into a hug. And I'm going to help you, okay? We'll figure this out together. Over the next few weeks, I focused on teaching Olivia everything I knew about running the restaurant. She soaked up the information like a sponge, eager to learn and prove herself. As I watched her confidently handle a rush of customers one day, I felt both proud and uneasy. Olivia was turning out to be a quick learner and a hard worker, but a little voice in the back of my mind warned me not to let my guard down completely. At first, everything seemed perfect. Olivia threw herself into the job with more enthusiasm than I'd ever seen from her before. She was always the first to arrive and the last to leave, taking on extra shifts and volunteering for the toughest tasks. But then I started hearing whispers. At first, I brushed them off as typical workplace gossip, but the rumors kept growing louder. One day, Paul, my head chef, pulled me aside. I think you need to know something, he said. Your sister, she's been saying things, stirring up trouble. A chill ran down my spine. What kind of things? I asked. Paul looked uncomfortable. She's been telling people they're underpaid, saying you're keeping all the profits for yourself. She's even suggested they go on strike. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. That's ridiculous. You all know how tight our margins are. I've always been open about the finances. We know, boss, Paul reassured me. None of us believe it, but there's more. He went on to tell me that Olivia had been claiming the restaurant rightfully belonged to her, saying I had somehow cheated her out of her share of the family money. It felt like a punch in the gut. After everything we'd been through, after I gave her a second chance, this is how she repaid me? That evening, I confronted Olivia, my hands shaking with anger and disappointment. What the hell do you think you're doing? I demanded. Olivia's face was blank, acting innocent. What are you talking about, sis? I told her everything I'd heard. To my shock, she just shrugged. Oh, that, she said casually. I was just testing the staff's loyalty, you know? Making sure they wouldn't turn on you. Looks like they passed with flying colors. I wanted to believe her really. I did, but something in her eyes, a cold and calculating glint, made me hesitate. Before I could say more, there was a frantic knock on my office door. Melissa, my assistant manager, came in looking pale and worried. Rachel, we've got a problem, she said. There's a big shortage in the cash register. Over $10,000 is missing. We spent hours going over the books, checking and rechecking everything. There was no mistake a significant amount of money was gone. Only four people had access to the register. 
Melissa, Paul, and Olivia. I had known Melissa and Paul for years they'd been with me from the start, through all the highs and lows. I trusted them completely. As if reading my thoughts, Olivia came up to me and whispered, You know, I've noticed Melissa staying late a lot recently. And she did just buy that fancy new car. Watching Olivia walk away, I knew I had a big decision to make. I couldn't ignore this, there was too much at risk. My business, my reputation, and the livelihoods of my loyal employees. Late one night, after everyone had left, I installed hidden cameras around the cash registers. It felt wrong, like I was betraying my staff's trust, but I didn't have a choice. For days, I watched hours of boring footage, my eyes burning from staring at the screen. And then on the fifth night, I saw it. Olivia, moving quickly and secretly, opened the register. Her hands darted in and out, stuffing cash into her pockets. My heart sank. I couldn't bring myself to confront her, so I called the police. The next day, as Olivia was finishing her shift, three officers walked in. The look on her face shock, then anger said it all. She started thrashing around, knocking over tables, and sending dishes crashing to the floor. I deserve this money. I should be rich, not you. You stole my life, she screamed as the police took her away. I felt nothing, no sadness, no regret, just an emptiness, where my love for her used to be. The next day, my parents stormed into the restaurant. Mom was crying, and Dad's face was red with rage. How dare you? Dad roared. Your own sister. Drop the charges now. I stood my ground. No. She stole from me. She needs to face the consequences. I pulled out my phone and showed them the footage of Olivia stealing. Look, I said. This is what your precious Olivia did. She's a thief. They watched the video, their faces going pale. But instead of understanding, their expressions hardened. You set her up, Mom accused. You've always been jealous of her. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Jealous? Are you kidding me? You gave me nothing and expected me to be grateful. Well, I'm done. Olivia made her choices, and now she is to live with them. They ranted and raved, switching between threats and pleas, but I didn't back down. Get out, I finally said. Get out of my restaurant and get out of my life. If you don't leave now, I'm calling the police. They left, but not before Dad spat. You'll regret this, Rachel. Mark my words. The trial was a nightmare. Olivia's tearful performance on the stand almost made me doubt myself. But then came a surprise witness, her former boss. He testified about how Olivia had pursued him aggressively, threatening to accuse him of sexual harassment when he rejected her. He also explained how she had stolen money from the company in retaliation. In the end, the jury found her guilty. As they led her away, she gave me one last look. There was no remorse in her eyes, only cold hatred. I haven't spoken to my family since that day. Sometimes, late at night, I wonder if I made the right choice. But then I look at what I've built, at the life I've made for myself, and I know I did. Standing in the kitchen of my newest restaurant, watching my staff prepare for the dinner rush, a sense of peace washes over me. This is my family now. This is my home. And nobody, not Olivia, not my parents, not anyone can take that away from me.